Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. My name is Melissa Boyd, and I will be presenting this morning to you. Um, my colleague, Sarah Peterson, who was set to join me, is unfortunately unable to attend uh, due to a family emergency. So let's send her all of the positive vibes. Um, so as I shared, my name is Melissa Boyd. I am currently director of high schools in Denver Public Schools and the former principal at Bruce Randolph School. Um, Sarah Peterson, my colleague, is the assistant principal currently at Bruce Randolph. And our focus has been on changing practice and mindset to implement competency-based grading practices school-wide. So Sarah and I focused on how to rethink traditional grading systems to create more equitable systems for our students of color. This project, this learning was based in one problem of practice, that our black and Latinx students were not yet demonstrating competency in math across seven required performance indicators by the conclusion of 10th grade. So a few years ago, the state of Colorado changed graduation requirements from only credits earned from coursework to include an ICAP and a competency demonstration. So ICAP stands for Individual Career and Academic Plan. That's an area where students do a variety of career planning thinking ahead to maybe potential universities they'd like to attend and using that to really guide the college planning process. Competency related to students demonstrating competency in both English and math. At Bruce Randolph, our data was demonstrating that our students were meeting the competency requirement, I'm sorry, our students were meeting the ICAP requirement based on a variety of school-based systems. They were also meeting the coursework requirement, but meeting competency, particularly in math, was another story. So within mathematics, there are seven performance indicators that a student needs to demonstrate competency in by the conclusion of 10th grade. Each performance indicator, like C2PI1, the fourth bullet down, is aligned with highly rigorous standards. Um, C2PI1 is actually a statement that includes seven common core state standards. And in order for students to demonstrate competency on C2PI1, they need to engage in a highly rigorous application task. Three of the seven performance indicators you see align with ninth grade content and are presented to students during their ninth grade year. The other four align with 10th grade content and are presented to students within their 10th grade year. However, I shared with you that we were having difficulty with our students demonstrating competency in math by the conclusion of 10th grade. And for those students, that would mean that during their 11th grade year, that they would have additional at-bats with these seven performance indicators as needed. Our goal is for 100% of students to demonstrate competency in math by the conclusion of 10th grade. And for that to happen, we need excellent mathematics instruction happening each and every day. This is some data illustrating our problem. By May of 2021, 92% of our students exited the 10th grade without demonstrating competency in math. In fact, only seven students exited their 10th grade year having demonstrated competency in math. So 
So when a student does not demonstrate competency in math by the conclusion of 10th grade, there are significant impacts on their math experience in both grades 11 and potentially 12. Firstly, 92% of students did not demonstrate competency of the major content from 9th and 10th grade, indicating significant gaps in their mathematical understanding. Next, 92% of these students will receive additional opportunities in 11th grade to demonstrate competency. The problem with that though, means that they're going to receive some below grade level instruction in order to demonstrate competency. We believe, as I'm sure you would agree, that each and every student deserves the right to be engaging in grade level content and grade level rigor each and every day. Without that, we are further perpetuating inequitable educational systems that impact our Black and Latinx students. So if we are going to improve the outcomes for our Black and Latinx students, we had to change a segment of our system, as well as teacher practice. Our learning was centered upon these three school-specific questions for inquiry. First, we wanted to know how we could increase competency-based learning practices to lead to more Black and Latinx students demonstrating competency in math. We also wanted to know what it would look like if we increase competency-based learning across content areas so that by the, the conclusion of 10th grade, that 75% of students are demonstrating competency in math and English. And third, we wanted to understand the impact that competency-based grading practices can have on teachers as they provide feedback to students and on students as they apply that feedback to increase their mastery of competencies. However, in order to change our systems and our practices at the teacher level, we knew that we needed to develop our capacity as leaders. These are the questions that we use to guide our leadership inquiry. They included what leadership skills do I need to develop in order to set up conditions that deepen educators skill to engage students in competency based learning feedback and revision cycles and develop a competency-based grading practice for the school. Lastly, we asked ourselves, what needs to be done so that by June of 2022, 40% of our students are demonstrating competency in English and math, and so that we're prepared to implement both technical and adaptive changes to engage students with a competency-based grading practice. Our data demonstrated that we needed to increase the percentage of students demonstrating competency in math by the conclusion of 10th grade. And so to track our progress, we identified the following goals. First, students demonstration of competency by the end of 10th grade on the seven performance indicators. We had a goal of 40% of students meeting competency in math by May of 2022 as they exited their 10th grade year. Then an increase in that goal of 75% of students meeting competency in math by May of 2023 as they exited 10th grade. Lastly, we wanted to see the development of a system for competency-based grading to start at the school by May of 2022. So in order to lead for change, we collaborated with a variety of stakeholders. And you can see some of their faces on your screen. Um, our students were a critical part of the work this year. You're gonna have the opportunity to hear from a few of them later. We also had a pilot group of high school teachers. We enc encouraged our entire teacher community to engage deeply in this work through a book study that I'll talk about soon. And lastly, our leadership team also played an integral part in this work.
Before I talk about our methods, I want to ground us a little bit in the Bruce Randolph School context. Um, if you don't know us, um, we're a pretty special place. So Bruce Randolph School is a 6th through 12th grade school located in Northeast Denver. And we primarily serve students that live in the Elyria, Swansea, and Globeville neighborhoods that co coincidentally reside in a food desert. The majority of our students come from some of the most economically, racially, ethnically, and environmentally marginalized communities in all of Denver. Approximately 90% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch, and 98% are students of color. Our largest demographic group are students that identify as Latinx, and 41% of which are multilingual learners who receive English language development. It's our school's mission to graduate 100% of seniors prepared to succeed without remediation in a four-year college or university. While we have not yet fully met our mission, we are proud to have an, an annual graduation rate of 95% or higher. We have an incredibly special school. Bruce Randolph School is named after Daddy Bruce Randolph, who was a local philanthropist and barbecue restaurant owner. Daddy Bruce was known for giving back to his community in a yearly Thanksgiving food drive. Giving back was central to who Daddy Bruce was and is also a charge that the faculty and staff at Bruce Randolph are deeply committed to. We are known for our innovative practices, including the development of the first urban agriculture pathway in Denver Public Schools, including the addition of a hydroponic farm that grows produce that our students eat in their lunches each day and food that our families take home to cook for their dinners each evening. At Bruce Randolph, we give back and do right by kids, which is a celebration that was shared by President Barack Obama in his State of the Union address. So although we have so much to be proud of, there is still significant work to be done. This data shows that most of our students are not yet meeting expectations in math on our interim assessments or the college ready benchmark on the SAT. This data shows that our math instruction does not yet allow our students to meet rigorous expectations. This data aligns with the low percentage of students that are able to demonstrate competency in math by the conclusion of 10th grade. So given this fact, we took action with three key change ideas. Firstly, we engaged a pilot group to engage in a book study and then implement practices from grading for equity as a part of the college ready on track network community within DPS. At the same time as the pilot group was implementing practices from grading for equity, we engaged our whole staff in a book study of grading for equity with the purpose of developing a collective competency-based mindset. And lastly, to support leadership inquiry and development, myself, Sarah Peterson, and our then assistant principal, and now Bruce principal Juanita Valdez, participated in some leadership coaching. So for our first change idea, we enlisted a consistent group of four high school teachers who were interested in making change. Sarah was the facilitation lead for the pilot group. And she supported them as they sought to understand the problem that we were trying to solve around grading, as well as what the potential solutions could be. They did this by engaging in tech study of grading for equity during the 2021 school year. And then during the 21-22 school year, they began to implement a variety of practices 
with the goal of establishing grading practices that were accurate, bias resistant, and motivational. The pilot group remained focused on these three pillars of equitable grading practices as they adopted a set of practices to try consistently across their classrooms. As they were trying out different practices, it was essential that they understood where students were coming from. And so our pilot group made sure to survey students to understand their experiences in their classrooms when it applied to competency-based learning and by engaging in case studies with individual students to more deeply understand experience. What became clear to the pilot group through the book study and application year is that developing a competency-based grading system is not only a technical change. This really requires an entire school community to have a developed competency-based mindset. Also, deep understanding of the content and standards for each grade level. Excellent instructional plans that are backward planned from summative demonstrations of mastery. And lastly, technical changes to rubrics and gradebook practices that are made explicit and transparent to students. That is to say, you cannot have competency-based grading practices in place if you do not have excellent competency-based instruction happening each and every day. So by the conclusion of the 21-22 school year, the pilot group established four common practices across their classrooms that were accurate, bias resistant, and motivational. Firstly, our teachers scored all products using competency rubrics. Next, they utilized a four, point, a four to eight point scale to score all products. Therefore, the lowest grade that a student would receive was a 50%. Students engaged in reteach and revision cycles in order to improve demonstrations of mastery. And lastly, process grades were eliminated. The work of the pilot group is continuing into the 22-23 current school year with a focus on further developing how reteach and revision cycles can be adaptive. This was an idea that our pilot group discussed with a teacher group from the Gwendolyn Brooks College Preparatory Academy in Chicago during the winter of 2022. The principal of that school is a colleague of mine through the Khan Fellowship. Um, we brought our two pilot groups together to talk over Zoom about the practices that were happening in each of our schools to further impact change and find new ways to embed competency-based grading practices in our schools. And the Gwendolyn Brooks School had a few years on us in competency-based learning practices and were in the process of trying a variety of change ideas themselves that was connected to adaptive pacing during reteach and revision cycles. So we were greatly appreciative of the Gwendolyn Brooks School for collaborating with us and providing inspiration into the work that the Bruce Randolph community is doing this year. So as our pilot group was implementing practices from Grading for Equity, we launched a whole school book study on the first five chapters of Grading for Equity. This work was facilitated by Sarah, um, Juanita, and myself. We launched the book study and were explicit that no one was to change their current grading practice and instead should focus on reflection about current practices. This felt a little sticky at times to some of our educators, and yet we found it to be very important that our space for learning remain in, in the reflective space. 
to do this book study, all of our teachers were assigned to a small group that was a, a four to five educators. And those groups remain consistent throughout the duration of the book study. Our book study met once monthly. They, there was a pre-assigned chapter for reading as well as reflection questions that were assigned. And we would come together first whole staff in order to launch the work and give focus to the book study session. And then our small groups would discuss based on either the provided reflection questions or on the ideas from the text that most resonated with them. At the conclusion of each book study session, the reading assignment for the next month was shared as well as the reflection questions. All of our participants were expected to read and engage in reflection prior to joining their book study session. And also important to name is that all of our pilot group teachers participated in the book study sessions as well. This allowed them to provide further support and share their current practices with their colleagues. This led to a lot of conversation around mindset shifts as well as lessons that they had learned. So during the spring of 2021, we were concluding the first year of our work with the pilot group and were observing a variety of mindsets in our educators regarding equitable grading practices and wanted to better understand those mindsets and how to move our entire school community. So we opted to join into partnership with Redesign, um, which is a group that some of you may know. And we began work with two coaches who supported our development as leaders in order to really impact our staff. Firstly, our primary redesign coach was Lori, and she supported us in, in better understanding the mindsets of our teachers and students as it related to competency-based learning. And so in May of 2021, uh, Lori engaged in empathy interviews and focus groups with teachers and students. These focus groups told us that students did not understand the grading systems that we were using. And our educators fell into approximately one of three categories. Um, first, we had folks that were ready to implement and were excited about competency-based learning practices. Um, those tended to be pilot group members. Um, we also had teachers that were interested in the competency-based mindset and systems, but were unsure where to start. And then we had interest in competency-based mindset and grading, but folks that were skeptical about some practices. And so Sarah, Juanita, and I engaged in bi-weekly coaching sessions with Lori and reflected on the impact of our work, both in terms of what was coming out of our pilot groups, what we were learning during our book group sessions with our whole school. And then this allowed us together to think about what were the moves that we needed to make in our own leadership to cause, to create further change. This may have looked like us crafting agendas together for upcoming sessions, um, planning professional learning sessions, um, planning surveys for gaining feedback. There were a lot of different ways that Lori provided our leadership team with time and space to reflect. And what's really important to name about this time with Lori is that it entirely focused on these efforts around competency-based learning. So while leadership encompasses so many things and is so very broad, the time and space with Lori was about the competency-based practices. So it really gave us, again, time and space to focus together on one thing. So each of these change ideas had an impact on the Bruce community. 
First, our pilot group made recommendations for whole school adoption of competency-based grading practices. The teacher feedback from the book study indicated that we were shifting mindsets where teachers were questioning their previous letter grade based grading systems and indicated a readiness to think further about how to implement competency based grading practices. And lastly, the continued collaborative reflection ensured that we as leaders continued to center our change efforts on the user experience. So to talk a little bit about our results. To further illustrate the impact of our three change ideas, I'm gonna dive into the student outcome results that were aligned with the goals that we shared previously. So the data that you're looking at reflects the percentage of students who exited 10th and 11th grade having demonstrated competency in math. So the first thing to notice is that for the class of 2024, they exited 10th grade with 38% of students demonstrating competency in math. This is 2% shy of our goal of 40%. However, it is an increase of 30% over the class of 2023 upon their exit from 10th grade. For the class of 2023, they exited 11th grade with 51.8% of students demonstrating competency in math, which is an increase of 43.8%. Further analysis of student subgroup data demonstrates that we have gaps for our multilingual learners and our students with IEPs. This data tells us that additional scaffolds and strategies appropriate for multilingual learners and students with IEPs are needed during instruction and assessment. The next goal that we identified included the development of a competency-based grading system by August of 2022. In the summer of 2022, the Bruce Randolph School Leadership Team met to establish expectations for a competency-based grading system. Given turnover in leadership and teaching staff, the team determined a few common expectations and then choices for teachers. So the following expectations were agreed upon for universal implementation. That includes all teachers utilizing the competency rubrics across grade levels and content areas to score and provide feedback to students. And second, the utilization of a consistent scale when giving feedback using the competency rubric. Other teachers, will continue other teachers continue to demonstrate their readiness to implement further competency-based practices and so they can choose to implement the following practices from our pilot group they can choose to use that four to eight scale when giving feedback they can choose to omit process grades and pra practice minimum grading where the lowest grade given is a 50 percent Teachers appreciated both the common expectations and choice in the additional competency-based practices. And there have been a number of folks who have chosen to fully opt in to um, the practices that were vetted through our pilot group. So, so much was learned um, about change management in our own leadership throughout the, the year and the work with both the pilot group and then our whole school efforts. Um, the work of our pilot group really emphasized how important it is to remain user-focused 
as you are building strategy and to enlist the best thinking of early adopters. We also see that with our pilot group, our work was able to continuously evolve and inform future strategy because it was just a couple of folks implementing practices. Um, next, we greatly value coaching and feedback and group leadership coaching had an, a great impact on our group, building our collective capacity to lead for competency-based practices and also to support our collective reflection. And lastly, I know that we all know this, but change really does take time. And when I think about all of the things that have been implemented at Bruce Randolph regarding competency-based grading practices, um, the school is entering their third year of practice. Um, so we typically hear real change takes three years and it seems that Bruce Randolph is on that journey um, in their third year. And so we wanted to provide some time um, after this overview to let you understand how the work at Bruce impacted our key stakeholders. And so um, I'm gonna introduce, I think I have some special people here today to join us um, to talk a little bit about how grading changed their learning and impacted it um, and recommendations that students may have. And then I also have a special teacher with us today. So um, Dallas, Alejandra, Giovanna, are you here? Yes, we have made it. We are here. We're glad to join you. Awesome. It is great to see you. So Dallas, um, could you get started and talk with us um, a little bit about how the work with competency-based grading has impacted your instruction, um, how this supported learning in your classroom, and any recommendations you might have for folks? I, um, when I started the competency-based grading, uh, I want to start with that I was very like skeptical of the whole idea, especially the 50% grading, um, and that that skepticism was okay, that I learned through the practice of the competency-based grading uh, that is an effective way to be clear with expectations for students. Like the biggest change in my instruction is that the, a change in student mindset from like it's not just work that we need to complete, but we need to understand ideas and there and we need to understand what are these like grade level standards for math. Um, so that was a big like mindset shift for my students that it's not just about how much work you get done, but it's about how much you understand about these 11th grade standards right. Um, uh, it was already including some of the work that I already do uh, with rubrics and things like that, but it just put it on an even playing field, which saved me a lot of time with grading. So instead of like thinking, oh, should the student get like an 85? It's more of like, did the student really understand and can explain their answer? Or does the student like lack some of that understanding when they show me work on their paper? Um, so that was one of the big changes. Uh, the minimum grading I thought was really impactful for some students who really have challenges in math, that it gives them a reason to like try every math problem. That if, as long as we're trying, as long as we're showing Mr. Jones that we did something, we learned something, um, then I'm able to give that 50% grading um, towards the end of the semester. It's really impactful because students aren't so like, their percentages aren't so low. So I don't have any students with 12% who just think my class is like pointless to even try at, but they're all very close. And that, hey, if you show Mr. Jones that you learned just a couple more things, um, then I can always improve your grade. Uh, we also include some things like replacing grades. So if you show me that you understand an idea further on along like our learning journey, um, then I'll replace the scores that you got uh, with that new learning. Um, so it's always just, it, it really ties in well with kind of the growth mindset that I'm always trying to learn new things and improve on my understanding so I can show Mr. Jones and then that's clearly reflected in my grade. Um, those four, five, six, seven, eight, or to try to get the percentages closer to like what they recommend in the competency-based grading book. Um, so that's kind of why we adapted that kind of shift in the grading scale. Um, and for any recommendations, I would just say 
for teachers to like have that skepticism, um, don't believe in it right away. And then it kind of, I feel like proves itself through like the implementation of it. Um, I have some great like feedback from students that they more understand like where their grades are coming from. And I just love hearing those things instead of just like, oh, I got to be, I don't really know what that means, but I got to be. Um, so uh, those were my major, I guess, the impacts of the competency-based grading. Thank you, Dallas. And I'm going to have you stick around in case there are some questions that come up for you in just a second. Um, I'm going to pop it over to our students, and then I'll ask that if anyone has any questions specific for Dallas from our pilot group or our students to pop those in the chat and then um, we'll take care of those. So you are now seeing um, Alejandra and Giovanna who experienced these grading challenges last year in both Dallas's math class and also in an English class. Um, and so ladies, I'd love for you to talk through um, how these changes to grading systems in English and math impacted your learning and any recommendations that you might have for teachers in schools as they implement change. Um, I think that it impacted my learning because uh, in my peers learning rooms because um, like if you got a seven like you want you knew that you got it that you got the concept correct, but you got the answer wrong. And it like when it, whenever you get like a higher grade towards your your eight, which is 100 percent, it kind of um you you then get to go back to your notes, which we um had an exact copy of Mr. Jones' notes. Um like we had our own notebook and you get to go back on your notes and reflect on on your whole steps and what you did wrong and then you get to change it. Um, and I feel like it also changed, like even students that don't really care or don't try, don't really try, even if they get a four, they understand that they tried and, and um, eventually they, they try to get a five and then a six and then it keeps going up. Um, in addition to what Giovanna said, I feel like it also um, helps like the motivation that students have towards their work because when, like even if they try just a little bit, they don't, completely get a zero percent so I feel like that helps them to like so that um how do I say like so that essentially so their grade isn't so low and it'll give them the motivation that they need to continue to try and like how she said to move from a five to a six to a seven to an eight. Can you both talk a little bit about if you had to give a recommendation to maybe one of your current teachers um who's not using these grading practices why do you think they should? Um, I feel like they should use that grading system because it allows the students to like really see where they're at on like their learn like their understanding of the concept because I feel like the um, teachers who use a normal grading scale it's like they give you a grade and you don't really comprehend why you got that grade until you use this grading scale and it's like okay well I got a seven I understand the concept but maybe I just like missed something or didn't do something correctly and I think uh, I I would recommend using that grading scale because zero to 100, like that is really big, a uh, big spectrum. And students are not gonna really like, like Alejandro said, understand why their grade is the grade that, they, that it is. Um, that big spectrum doesn't really, it's like, it, it's divided into letters, but then 50% of that whole zero to 100 is an F. So like, even if you try, like you completely fail the class. So I think that this is an important grading skill because even if you put, um, you know, the formula that you learned, but you didn't understand the later concept, you're still gonna get a grade for it because you memorized at like part of the unit that you learned. Thank you. Um, I think you said something really important there. And this is really what we saw as a need for making the shift is how, when you're using that zero to 100 scale, a lot of it is an F, right? More than half of that grading scale gives students a failing grade. Um, Dallas, there's a question for you in the chat box from Vicki. Um, could you talk about, um, it says, did you need to change how you communicated with families? Hi, Sarah. 
did you need to change how you communicated to families about grading and then what worked um, and how did you maybe shift some family mindset? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say as far as I feel like because students can understand where their grades are coming from that that can kind of replace some of me explaining the new grading scale that students like if I give a student with a seven like their paper back in front of their parents they could, they could say just like Gio and Alejandro said that it's like, oh, I really like I understood this idea. I just made a small math mistake like in the middle of my work. So it wasn't absolutely perfect, but I understand what's going on in this problem. And they could say that same thing for a five and a six as we spend more time within that. And if it was adopted kind of school wide, that now everybody knows that if I get a six, whether that's in science, whether that's in math, whether that's in history, it means that I didn't fully understand the idea that Mr. Jones or my teachers were trying to teach me. Um, and that I need to go back to some of my learning and kind of like Gio said, reflect on that and see what are the parts that I'm missing? Why don't I fully understand this idea? Um, so I feel like that, that shift into like, what do you understand is fairly easy for, for parents to communicate to parents. That hey, your student like really understood this concept, but they're, they're just making these small mistakes. Here are the mistakes that they're making. But it's still like a seven out of eight is still an A. I still say that to my students. I, as long as you understand these grade level ideas, that you're still getting that high score for it. And I think there. Hi, I'm Sarah Peterson. I had an odd morning and I apologize for being late. Um, but when we talk to parents, a lot of the question that they have is just, is this preparing my kid for college? Like they want to know that kids are still prepared to be successful the next step. And what we have found is that our students are more likely to understand their level of mastery and um, their own next steps. And so I was thinking about college readiness. Those are huge, two huge steps for students to know what their mastery is, what they still need to learn, and then know what they need to do to learn that. Um, if we can send all of our kids to college with that knowledge, I think that we're doing okay. And so um, we've tried to frame those conversations with families as well so that they're aware of how this will translate into any post-secondary choice their student makes. Um, I see a question about grading scale across different content areas. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit, Dallas, about the work in the pilot group, which included folks who were not math teachers, and how this four to eight scale worked across contents? Yeah. Um, I think the four to eight scale is really an understanding or like a comprehension scale that would work across really any idea that I have different ideas for these different levels of understanding in my mind after doing like student work that I know what a seven looks like, what a six looks like, what a five looks like in my own classroom. And then I can grade according to that scale. So it's not about the topic necessarily. It's just kind of a universal scale for all understanding of really any topic that you would want to get to. Um, so it really applies, I think, to any subject um, that if you're grading on a rubric and you're sticking to grade level standards. So as long as you're doing those things, um, then every, I think every subject has that kind of understanding uh, tied to it. Do you fully understand the grade level idea or do you still need some work in showing that you understand that idea is really the messaging we want to send to students. Thank you. Just want to address a couple other questions. Um, and like Sarah Dallas, um, feel free to jump in. Um, there's a question about the four to eight scale. Um, just on that one, um, we are not yet using, um, our district is not yet used for secondary, um, a competency-based grade book or a competency-based transcript. So we're using the same grade book in Schoology that all of our schools do. Um, assignments for our pilot group and anyone using the four to eight scale are put in like out of eight points. Um, so I think that's one piece to mention. Um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about um, the types of tasks that folks are engaging kids with in order to say these are demonstrations of mastery? Um, what comprises a task that would be a demonstration of mastery? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that Dallas hit it on the head where we really start from the rubrics. So we think about what is the competency that we want students to master? What 
standards are aligned to that? What is a topic that allows students to really dig in and demonstrate mastery? But we want to make sure that that grade level mastery is the thing that we are aiming for. Um, and, and so once we start with that competency, think about the rubric pieces, think about um, the standards that are aligned, then we'll build tasks that ideally are culturally relevant tasks that um, students are interested in, especially um, I'm a former science teacher and in science, there's so much that you can do that students can apply their learning to the lives that they're living. So like if we are learning about nutrients, talking about food deserts and talking about the ways that um, nutrient access impacts long-term health outcomes is something that um, is a really easy application and then allows students to demonstrate mastery on perhaps argumentative writing. And so we want to think about tasks that are engaging for students and then that also align to the rubrics. I only put in the gradebook grade level tasks uh, that are attached to grade level standards, though I still can grade and give students checkpoints along the way to those tasks. So I can grade anything on the four to eight scale, but the only thing that's gonna go into the grade book that impacts your grade is the grade level work. And so I choose, yeah, th those sort of tasks, um, usually from ENET or whatever my assessment is that is on grade level. And just to speak to the four to eight scale, uh, we changed that in the book. It, it's the, just the idea of the zero, one, two, three, four, but the percentage when you get one out of four is 25%. So we, you know, we wanted to change that so it reflects kind of the grading practices that like a five corresponds to a D, a six is kind of that C, uh, seven is the high B, almost an A, and an eight is a perfect score. Uh, and that could also include like a distinguished rate or it's not distinguished, uh, beyond exceeding expectations bullet. So if there's like another exceeding level to your work, you can use the eight as that. And we should just note, if we could use a zero through four scale and have it automatically convert, we would, because I think that that would be easy for students. We live in a world where LMSs are not the most innovative and adaptive systems all the time. And so we tried to create a scale that students could use and the LMS wasn't functioning well. And so the zero to eight scale was, or the four to eight scale was our response to just working within the system that we have, working within the technology that we have, knowing that we are trying to make changes that are a little bit ahead of the capabilities right now. And I did see a question about if we use the rubrics in the LMSs. We sometimes do. Um, what we found is that it can be really helpful for students to look at a paper rubric to see like highlighted where they are currently on that rubric and what they need to do to move forward. And so the rubric scores always go into the LMS, but um, at least for my students, I found that they were not interacting with the rubrics as much when it was electronic as when it was paper in front of them. And so we have the capability. It's just a decision on how to best use it for students. I think another point to make, um, and Marianne and I are, are messaging about this. Um, so Denver Public Schools developed a set of competency rubrics across content areas. Um, so just to use the math example from earlier, there are those seven performance indicators there is a rubric for each of the performance indicators that describes a student performance from a partially meeting all the way to an exceeding level. Um, so that exists for each performance indicator for math. They also exist for informative writing, argumentative writing. Um, and our social studies and science competency rubrics are almost identical to the language arts rubrics. Um, the difference for like a science rubric, for example, may be that it includes the language of, um, students are using scientific specific language in their writing. Um, so that allows for also our students to be seeing common language in rubrics across classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so these are not at all teacher developed. Um, they are district developed. Um, let's see, Dallas and Sarah, could you talk, um, Christy wrote a question that um, was upvoted as well. Um, can you talk about um, any tips or ideas when you think about shifting student mindset around what learning looks like? Um, how do you help students focus on learning outcomes rather than just earning points um, and, and what they're okay with about what versus what they're mastering? 
Yeah, and one thing I would just want to add to what you said about the rubrics, in a perfect world, we would spend three years with teachers developing rubrics. Like there is value to that process. And we work in education where time is always a limiting factor. And so we made the decision to use those rubrics so that teachers had a high quality material, knowing that like ideally teachers would create their own with a lot of professional development around that. Um, as far as the mindset goes, um, I would say that the the competency based grading already has kind of that um, that growth mindset kind of within it that hey we're always striving to grow and that's an easy messaging kind of idea that I can do to students right hey you're doing a great job you're starting to really get this idea you got a six this is what you need to move to that seven which would then prepare you for the next class or prepare you for college, right? So we're always trying to get to those sevens of meeting expectations because those are the skills that we need to get to college. And when I'm grading every single thing on that scale and we're, we're always trying to move up that scale, um, I feel like I can really kind of motivate or try to get that motivation on like, why do we want these higher scores? What, what does that get us? And then it's reflected in our grade, right? So it's not, you know, how much homework I turned in, but how much I understand the math that Mr. Jones is giving me. And that's where my grade comes from. Um, and, and I think that the same thing, the idea is that in college, I need to know where my gaps are when it, when it gets even less like teacher led, that this kind of shows me like, hey, this is the part that I'm missing. And I can see that on the rubric, I'm missing this idea. This is the gap in my learning that I need to fill in. Um, so it's trying to have be more kind of student led as far as like what is my understanding what where am I on this rubric and how do I get to that next level. What we found is that with the exception of very few students, our learners opt out because they get confused on what it takes to be successful or they feel like if they work really hard, they still won't be successful. And so our goal with these changes is to create a system that alleviates both of those. It is clear for students, they know what their next steps are going to be based on the common rubrics, based on common feedback, based on revision cycles that they know are coming. And they know that if they do those things, that they can get their grade to passing. It's not gonna be this hopeless situation. And so like, I had one student last year who would get a six and be like, man, that's probably fine, I'm good with that. Um, but he was the one-off, he was a single exception. And I don't think that we make plans based on exceptions. I think that once they see the system working then they will also come along, but the majority of students really felt good about that. Um, Alejandro and Gio, any addition that you have on that? Like based on this process, how it impacted your learning and made you invested in learning instead of just grades? No, but I do know that um, in Schoology, in Schoology, like you, there's two links. There's the process and the mastery. And I feel like with that system of four to eight, that's going to help you also understand like those two resources will help you understand how a student is um, understanding and how to reflect that on um, like finals or um, end of the unit tests. I feel like what you was saying, right? Hey, I have these three topics that are going to be on this final, right? I have sevens in two of those and a five in the other one. So I know which one I need to review on and which like topic that I need for my final do I not fully understand right now, right? Uh, so that's kind of getting some student agency and their own learning as far as like bigger assignments. Um, I also think it's very motivating for students who miss chunks of time that it's still, I don't have this huge packet of work for you to do. These are just the ideas that we covered over this time. And that's what I need you to understand. And you can still demonstrate mastery without maybe doing every single assignment to like make up, which can be really daunting for students. Before school. And he was here yesterday. All right, well, I'm gonna just thank Dallas and Gio and Alejandra for joining Sarah, who we are so glad was able to make it. Um, just to close us out, um, we, we just appreciate you taking some time out of your day to listen to the Bruce Randolph journey that connects to competency-based learning and grading practices. Um, we know that in education, there's absolutely no shortage of how we can spend our time. 
And so again, just, um, just gratitude to you for spending it with us today. Um, on this slide, you can find the Bruce website. Um, additionally, there is contact information here for both Sarah and myself, although I'm noticing there's a mistype in Sarah's name. So Sarah just updated that um, here. And um, I believe we have a survey that's linked as well um, for you all to take in closure. That should be coming into the chat box. Survey is on the way. Um, so yes, yeah, so please just take that survey. Um, if you have any questions, please email Sarah or myself. We are happy to collaborate in the future. Bye, bye.